Uh, so I'm going to talk about the oceans. I might be one of the only ocean people here and talk about um, particularly uh, marine ecosystems and a particular marine ecosystem, uh, coral reefs, which has been put up as the poster child for climate change in a lot of different scenarios. But I'm going to give you the context of that by giving you a, a history of coral reefs and climate change from the time that coral reef science actually started through today and sort of uh, point out some lessons along the way and then maybe uh, have some time to promote some solutions. So um, I don't know if you can see this, but there are these top two slides are healthy reefs in 1975. That was the year that I got my diving cer certification. And the reefs uh, in Florida here in Jamaica were indeed very gorgeous. This is what they look like today, um, quite degraded. This is a symptom of the Caribbean situation with coral reefs. It's not everywhere. I'm working in the Indo Pacific right now. The reefs there are still a lot of gorgeous reefs, a lot of 100% coral cover. But in the Caribbean, this is sort of an, people have focused on this because they feel like it's a, a look into the future for the reefs elsewhere. It's definitely a, a reefs, many reefs have crossed the tipping point. So here is a diagram. I'm going to use this as sort of the, the frame for the talk, starting in the early you know, 1970s when reef science really started getting going. It really didn't get going before then because we couldn't spend much time underwater uh, until scuba gear was invented. Um, if you look at the blue line here, this is the Caribbean percent coral cover over time. <coughs> it's based on, this one shows two different studies, but generally you can see that the decline, the original reefs had at least 60% coral cover. Um, prior to this period, and it's been progressively going down. This is a similar um, um, graph for the Pacific, and it's not nearly as bad as in the Caribbean, but there's still a decline. So what's caused these declines? For, when I first put this talk together, I said, well, I'm going to give a timeline of everything, and I'm like, oh my god, that's way <laughs> too much. <laughs> this is way too much. but. At least on this slide, I can say this is the period 1990 to 2010 when there was a severe decline of coral reefs in the Caribbean. So what I'm going to do is talk about mostly decade by decade how our attitudes about coral reefs and climate change have changed over time. So in the early part, when I first started looking at coral reefs, whoops, in the 1970s, uh, the, the mantra was coral reefs are resilient. You can hit them really hard with cyclones. Sometimes uh, biological invasions kill, knock the reefs back, but they bounce back very quickly. They're just a vibrant system. Um, they're also, when there was any talk about future climate change, the, the pervasive thought was, well, they love warm water. They're going to expand. Bring it on. It's great. So here was the pervasive debate going at the time. Um, on in, and this hasn't gone away, but the crown of thorns starfish, this is a biological problem. These can devastate a reef. They're not in the Caribbean. They're only in the Indo-Pacific. They're huge. This is live coral, this little green part right here with the starfish on it. This has all been stripped of live coral cover by these starfish. This is an amazing thing to see underwater. It's, it's this big and round. Well, they vary, but they can get plate size or bigger and they avert their stomach, digest the tissue, and it's, it's disgusting. Um, and they have these huge natural boom and busts, right, um, in population. So it's known that a lot of starfish do this. They go boom and bust, boom and bust. But these bu booms were big booms on the Great Barrier Reef in particular, and there was a lot of debate about what caused it. As we moved into the 1980s, this was the the decade when I moved to Australia, and that crowd of thorns starfish debate was really going uh, bonkers between the scientists, uh, there was also a lot of other reef degradation being recognized. Most of that was, was blamed on land-based sources of pollution, sugarcane farming, other kind of farming, just direct insults to the reef. So <laughs> there was recognition that reefs were declining. There was also in the Caribbean in 19... 83, 
there was um, a sea urchin that was wiped out that turned out to be a key species on that reef and it caused a lot of those reefs to flip into an alternate state which is dominated by algae. Yeah, diadema and Tularum. Yeah. Yes, exact, yeah. exactly, diadema and Tularum. You, as long as you pronounce it right, you can say that. <laughs> Um, That's how the Brits say it. <laughs> they do it wrong. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, this was also um, 95 or 97 percent of the corals in the Galapagos were killed off during the 82-83 El Nino. So people were like, "Ooh, maybe warming's not a great thing for coral reefs." And El Nino became not a. I put a lab hold world word wasn't quite a household world at the, word at the time, but reef scientists knew what it was. Peter Glenn in Florida really elevated that issue. These are, these are smaller bleaching events. This one was a whammy, mostly in the Eastern Pacific and not globally. Then, like I said, this long spine sea urchin, Diadema antelarum, key herbivore on the reef, 97% mortality beginning in 1983, probably due to a pathogen that came in on ballast water of a ship that came through the Panama Canal wiped out this species almost completely, still hasn't come back. It's trying to in a few places, but this, like I said, led to big ecological phase shifts on a lot of these reefs, in combination with other factors, but this was a, the last straw for sure. So we see a, a, the beginning of the major decline in the Caribbean reefs there. Coral bleaching, this was the decade when coral bleaching came on the map. I mean, global climate change came on the map in terms of impacts on coral reefs. So there was increasing and more widespread coral bleaching events. Um, almost all of the events were linked to warmer temperatures. It, was, it wasn't rocket science to do that. There, there were other factors like light and circulation patterns, but temper warm temperatures were the culprit. And in 97, 98, a huge percentage of the reefs globally bleached. A lot of them died. So at this stage, about a fifth of the world's coral reefs were effectively gone, and about 15% and about of reefs worldwide were blamed on, uh, the loss of 15% of reefs worldwide was blamed on that one single event. So it wasn't hard to find a coral reef scientist that said, I believe in climate change. Um, so this, this one big event, is really what got people going. Yes, but, uh, back Marty. Back late, by 98, nobody had been worried about acid oceans and yep. ocean yep. acidification. That didn't happen until the No, that, that issue was first raised <laughs> in 1999, and I was one of the people that raised that issue. And most of the feedback we got was, why the hell are you bringing this up when we got so many other problems? Yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting response from the reef community. Um, yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, anyway, this was a really interesting time. This is the percentage of reefs that experienced severe bleaching. Now keep in mind, in those early 70s and prior to that, people rarely saw bleaching events. They were usually isolated events, usually due to freshwater inputs or, or maybe a small warming event or something, but it wasn't, they weren't observed and there was no folklore in history like the Aborigines on the Great Barrier Reef talking about the, great white, the year of the Great White Reef. Just, just wasn't evidence that this was happening. So it became a very alarming issue and it brought out a lot of alarmists with it. But if you look at, you know, the amount of bleaching, it varied a lot from basin to basin, but it was in every basin. So the 97, 98 put the fear of uh, INSO into coral reef scientists globally um, and in fact, this last threat that we were going to have another big one has sent lots of people into the field trying to do the before analyses. But since then, I think people are calming down since the, the claims, the, the predictions have gone down. So um, these, these events led uh, a lot of people to start looking at what's the future of coral reefs with global warming. And this is based on Hadley Center data. It's a work by Ove Head Goldberg done a lot of the stuff and he basically said oh by 2050 all the reefs are going to be gone because bleaching events will occur so frequently we're going to lose them all that got a ton of media attention it's got caused a lot of strife for a lot of us trying to argue for protecting reefs because you go 
talk to policymakers and they say, well, why bother? They're all going to die anyway, kind of thing, right? So this was, a, this was a difficult issue to get past. It also didn't consider adaptation. So even though adaptation kind of muddies the waters on our predictions, it's really uh, corals can, ad and talking about coral adaptation, not human adaptation. I realize most people in here are focused on humans. Um, so corals can adapt to warmer temperatures. Not fast enough, probably, but certainly some species can adapt. We're seeing a lot of variation and a lot of uh, natural selection already going on. So it, this is a ray of hope. This is, this is the part of the talk where I think there's a lot of hope. The Caribbean then was hit again by another issue, which may or may not be related to climate change, and that is disease. A ton of diseases popped up. I can't even name them all. They all have really cool names like white spot disease, uh, white band disease, black band disease. Um, there were a ton of diseases and caused havoc in the Caribbean. This is when, again, we see this huge decline in coral reef cover. There was a lot of debate on the causes. There's certainly links to human sources. There are pathogens and bacteria found in human guts that actually infect, you know, cross species and infect corals. And that has been the, the source of a lot of some of the diseases, not all of them. Uh, so cleaning up our water supply was thought to be a way to prevent these diseases in the future, and that's happening in Florida. But climate also seems to play a role because warmer waters cause greater virulence of these uh, bacteria and these uh, viruses that uh, kill the corals. And heat stress of the corals, whether or not it's an extreme event or not, just background, warmer background temperatures, particularly in the winter when they're trying to store fat, uh, makes them more vulnerable to infection. So here's an example of a coral disease. This is also a wake-up call. This is a Acropora. Acropora. <laughs> <laughs> some people say Acropora, some people say Acropora. Yeah, Acropora uh, palmata, which is the, you know, the elkhorn coral for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. This species was the dominant species of coral. Anytime I had gone to the Caribbean, this is what you saw. It's the cornerstone species of, uh, of a reef. Uh, it died mostly of disease, a few other things like cyclones and so forth, but uh, it's now only about 5-10% of its original uh, abundance. And it's now listed um, in the IUCN uh, list as critically endangered. Then overfishing came on the scene. This has been, thank you. Uh, and this was an interesting paper by Jeremy Jackson, who's done a lot of fantastic work, but he made this unfortunate statement that ecological extinction caused by overfishing precedes all other pervasive human disturbance to coastal ecosystems, including pollution, et cetera, and climate change. A lot of people took this. It changed the focus away in a lot of the uh, researchers in coral reef community from climate change to overfishing. So now when you ask, you know, I've done a few surveys of reef scientists, and now when you, you know, ask people what is the worst threat to coral reefs, they're going to say overfishing. It tells you how much science can be changed by uh, a single person or a single paper. Anyway, I, the paper didn't intend to, to it, it really wanted to just, you know, bring up a local impact, but it led to the perception that climate change was over-trumped. And then finally, ocean acidification. And even though this was proposed in 1999, it didn't really come on the scene until 2005. I think that's because we put together a report similar to an AGCI report. And I think the key in that report is that we listed a lot of research, specific research that could be done. So after that report was done, people would come up to me and say, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one. It actually gave people jobs. It really keyed in and gave people jobs. And the co-authors in that report didn't like that we did that, but it really put a tangibility to the report, and it got a lot of circulation because of that. This is also something that's hard for people to get their heads around. They believe it because it's, the chemistry is so clean, but it's also a, uh, considered a non-lethal problem in the future. It's, as Mickey Glantz would call it, it's a creeping environmental problem. So people put it out there like osteoporosis, 
We know it's a problem, but it doesn't kill you. Let's, let's just keep you from falling. It's that kind of analogy. I won't talk about that. And I don't think I'll talk about that because I want to go to some of the... It doesn't uh, kill corals? It's a, it's CO2, acidification from CO2? Is that it, it, uh, it decreases their resilience. So it, they cannot grow as fast. They are eroded much more quickly. Their ability to build reefs and habitat is, de is uh, decreased. They become more uh, susceptible to bioerosion. And I think the worst problem is the coral larvae when they're settling and trying to, you know, reestablish in new areas, they have a harder time getting established. But, but doesn't that depend on the actual pH of the, of the environment? I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah. So if the... Uh, the it's a gradual death. <laughs> no, it's not so, so the W your question is, it depends on the pH of the environment. Yeah, as the CO2 level in the atmosphere goes up and the oceans become more, more acidic, acidic, isn't yeah. there going to be some point where it's not going to be gradual? It'll be outside the zone of which they can exist ecologically. Yes, and that's if you go b through and look at, you know, the last time, 55 million years ago, when we had a big spike in CO2, the reefs d declined uh, considerably. They didn't go completely away. But the corals themselves aren't killed. It's just that you're, you're lowering the resili their resilience in some ways. I mean, there, I could go on about this a lot, so I don't want to uh, talk to you about, about it. But okay. it's a big issue. But it's, these kind of points, these things that you're asking, are hard to get across to people. Ocean acidification isn't on here at all. This is the decline in, in the Great Barrier Reef uh, coral cover over time. This is the average for the whole Great Barrier Reef. And I'll, I'll concentrate on this graph. So it goes from 30% in 1985 to about half that in 2010. Most of the loss of coral cover is due to the crown of thorn starfish infestations, which continue to this day, cyclones, and then this little green part is due to bleaching. So the authors of this paper recognize that bleaching is a big issue, but it's a little hard, you know, depending on how people pitch this, bleaching looks like a really small issue. We know it's going to continue in the future. Doomsday or a prophet? So one of the things that has really driven coral reef scientists are the doomsdayers. Um, I put this up here. I think it's interesting. Um, it's the Merriam-Webster definition, one who warns or predicts calamity, especially without justification. But here's an example. This is the example they gave. Some called him Chicken Little. But the climatologist had the data to back up his warning on global warming. <laughs> <laughs> so we've made it into the Merriam-Webster dictionary. I found that by accident. So, you know, you think about the motivations of a doomsdayer. Call attention to a legitimate issue, for sure. Invoke a needed action, for sure. To gain personal attention or benefit. Or to waste others' time. <laughs> right? Here's a quote. Co-author, somebody, told Gu Guardian Australia that current climate trend signal current climate trend signal game over for the Great Barrier Reef. Wow! That's a serious claim and you can imagine how that impacts uh, public opinion about this. Pollyanna are optimist, okay? Pollyanna also from Merriam-Webster, a person characterized by irrepressible optimism. I'm no Pollyanna but I do think good will come out of this. This cartoon is really funny if you can't read it. It's the end of the world, and Pollyanna says, well, that certainly tidy things up, didn't it? <laughs> so motivations, avoid gravity of the problem or demote others, motivate others to keep trying, to gain personal attention or benefit, or to waste others' time, <laughs> right? It's basically, we need both people. They may waste our time, but they may not. I think we need both messages. I think we need people to realize the gravity of the situation, but also have solutions. Doomsday. Think about solutions. Yeah, doomsday. <laughs> it's good. And so the evolution. Um, here's what has driven coral reef research. Unexpected or dramatic events. That's really what's driven it. The more visual, the better. The more visual we can make a problem, the better. We tried really hard to make ocean acidification visible. But when 60 Minutes called me the other day and said, we want to do something on ocean acidification, where are the coral reefs dying? And I couldn't say, it's killing, you know, it's, it's hurting the reefs, but it's not killing them. 
he said, we're not doing the story. <laughs> so uh, also for creeping problems, you can't use dramatic events. You need individuals, and this is where leadership comes in. Also, doomsday, I, I won't go over that because I know I'm out of time. The lessons, what's enabled progress in the coral reef and, and climate change world, visible impacts, better models, observations, and interdisciplinarity, particularly young researchers, really are equipped to do this much better than we are. Strong leadership, other people have mentioned this. This is essential. Leaders bubble up to the top or you can find them and push them up to the top and proactive communication. What has slow progress? Increasing population and declining economy. Uh, lack of roadmaps towards solutions. And I think this is where AGCI comes in. You're really good at helping, from what I can tell from the review that Jerry gave and what I've seen, getting those roadmaps is important. And um, also, I put ocean who here because people do not um, pay attention to oceans like they do on land. And so I will end with that. And I'm sure I'm out of time. Yep. So um, I'll end with a happy note, which is a solution. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I'm out of time. <laughs>